It is a shame that I have to stand here and beg today it is as disgraceful. a member of the British Empire. Absolutely disgraceful. We're remembering the dead. I am but ashamed of the living. British. I'm not ashamed to say it. If it hadn't been for Jack, they certainly wouldn't have got it because nobody would have bothered. Without Jack's lobbying and continued fighting, I think it would have been imp impossible. It's Jack was, you know, really putting the thorn into their side that they had to do something. Anybody who's come to Hong Kong, any MP, regardless of which party, I have demonstrated. March the 4th, 1996, a day of victory for war veteran Jack Edwards. It was a 10-year battle for justice that took the former prisoner of war around the world and, in the end, earned him victory as well as a little fame. Fame is nothing, love. Fame doesn't matter. It's what you do with fame. What Jack did was the unenviable task of lobbying the Hong Kong and British governments, fighting for British passports for the wives and widows of World War II veterans. Our husbands uh, did fight for the colony and they were even made prisoners of war. So the least they could do is to do something back for the wives and widows. That's why I think Jack was very persistent. If he didn't keep on egging, I think uh, we would have been forgotten. John Major should be absolutely, I hope he chokes on his toast this morning. For one man to take on the entire British government was really something quite outstanding. And he achieved it, and it, it, it took a long time, a lot of bravado, and a lot of lobbying in the most extraordinary circumstances. Radio host Ralph Pixton recalls one of those circumstances last year in Japan. Hello? Jack managed to get into the hotel where the Prime Minister was staying through the servants' entrance, climbed through a window, and confronted the Prime Minister as he was coming out of his room to go down for the conference. Now that's the sort of lobbying that really a young man would do, not a man approaching 80. But for this old soldier, fighting battles is second nature. What a day. Jack Edwards was born in Wales in 1918, in the final months of the First World War. The youngest of a family of five, Jack's namesake, his uncle, never returned from the front lines. The experience left the family opposed to war. So before the outbreak of World War II, Jack volunteered for the army on his father's suggestion. Because that way you can join a unit where you won't be put into the PBI. I said, what's the PBI? The poor bloody infantry. So I joined the signal, thinking I would be safe. Doesn't happen. Jack spent close to four years in a Japanese POW camp in Taiwan. Of over 500 prisoners, only 64 would survive. Every day we were taken out and marched to the beaches of North Changi. Our job was to go into the water, to wade into the water cut free barbed wire which was in the water, the hundreds of Chinese civilians, the Japanese were mowing down with machine guns, and dragging them up the beach and burying them. And that went on day after day. I could still smell it. I'd been right at the bottom. When I was being um, roughly roughed up and tortured, really, I was dragged out because the Japanese were convinced I was a leader and whipped me over unmercifully until I was completely unconscious. I felt at that time I was dead. You feel if you survive anything like that, you survive for a purpose. I didn't know what the purpose was then. When the atomic bomb dropped, World War II and Jack's imprisonment came to an end. He began the painful road to recovery. It took his return to Hong Kong in 1963 and a visit to the graves of his comrades that helped him get back on track. One of my own men, Jimmy Barber, God bless him. And I looked at the ages, 21, 22, 23. I thought, my God, what have you been knocking yourself about all these years? You're 46. They went west when they were 22, 23. You've had all those years. Make something of them. Make something of them. That's 
the uh, feeling I got walking around. And that was really the start of me being determined I would make my time in Hong Kong count. The rest, as they say, is history. Since taking up the fight for veterans' rights, he's won them pensions, free medical treatment, British passports, and more recently, passports for the war wives and widows. It's also won him a reputation as a tenacious campaigner. Physically as well as mentally, it reminds me of uh, a terrier, a little, the little kind of dog that once it gets its teeth into something, doesn't let go. Jack keeps on fighting, and it's that fighting spirit that, again, kept him alive uh, in a Jap POW camp and has really won the case for the war widows and their dependents. Andy Nielsen first met Jack after he drew a series of political cartoons supporting Jack's cause. And he took his art one step further. Jack is still an old soldier and, still, st and very proud of it and still fighting, st in a way still fighting the war. I still have my dreams, my wife would tell you. I still have my dreams. She knows when I've had them. I wake up sweating, sometimes shouting. Terrible dreams sometimes. My worst dream, and I hate it, is that I'm back there again. While Jack finds it hard to forget, he devotes a lot of time to ensuring the memory of servicemen lives on. I deal with the legacy of war, the people who need assistance who are alive. But more important, I deal with those who've also died. Their relatives want to know how they died, where they're buried, etc. From the cramped headquarters of the Royal British Legion, Jack carries out the bulk of his work, his applying for grants for war veterans to tracing graves of lost servicemen. Every time I'm finding a grave, somebody else is calling out, I want to be remembered. So they decided and each week, he receives more and more requests like for copies of his book. Lists of people. These are lists of people. All for my book. It details his experiences as a prisoner of war, a book which took 40 years and three attempts before he was able to complete it. Four years later, in 1992, it was translated into Japanese. For such a vocal activist, it seems fitting he devote his leisure time to the Welsh male voice choir. I think it gets a great buzz out of it. I mean, it's, it's a long time since Jack left home in, in South Wales. Um, but he's obviously still fiercely proud of his, his Welsh roots. That's one more day the bastards can't make us do. That's one more day we survive. So whenever I sing that with the choir now, I think of those days. While he misses Wales, Hong Kong has been his home for over three decades, a home he shares with his wife, Polly. But that's one aspect of his life he's not so vocal about. Not many people in the choir are probably aware that Jack is even married, let alone know her. She's uh, a local girl. She's very quiet, but do not take that as a sense of weakness. I've got a pretty good idea who runs the house and it is not Jack. I'd like to go to university. I'd love to have gone to I'd love to have had a university degree. Well, I went to a university where we didn't have degrees. My university was my prison camp, but I learned how to live. I learned how to live. With so much behind him, Jack is not yet ready to fold away his flag. His next target is the Japanese government for an apology of World War II atrocities. He's tapping away at a follow-up book, this one on his investigations of war crimes. And he says he won't rest until the promised passports for war wives and widows are firmly in hand. I won't believe it until I see those passports here. And I won't let up on the government in Great Britain, John Major, or anybody who comes here and tell those passports are safely in Hong Kong. Jack, Jack will never retire. 
Jack will always have some principle, some cause for other people he'll work for. That's Jack's life. He'll never give up. Here comes the 